Pensei que iria fazer meu uh, discurso em português, mas uh, reconheci que meu inglês é melhor que meu português, então... The other thing I was going to tell you, I was just going to tell you a joke that, uh, you know, earlier on the, with the joke that uh, Jose, uh, Jose made, he, uh, he made this uh, joke and, and it took a while for the English speakers to get the translation. And uh, one time I was giving a talk in uh, Mexico City, and I've told this story before, a few of you might have heard this, and uh, I was going really fast, and I told a great joke, and I waited, and everybody started laughing. And then the next day, uh, somebody was on a drive with me, and they said, that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I was like, well, the joke wasn't that good. And what had happened was the translator was so far behind, the translator said, he just said something really funny. Please laugh. I'm really behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, humility. That's what this profession is about. Um, so, uh, so this, for me, this was a, a tough topic uh, because this is not necessarily the area where I do my research. Um, I spend some time on the periphery of this, but this is an area where I tr uh, there's a few economists I trust quite a bit, and I, 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 I kind of look to them for guidance. And uh, my first slide is a little cynical here. Um, this is my slide. <laughs> You know, when you it, it, when you start to talk with some people about this and ask them the question, what works? It's like, well, we don't know or nothing. Um, in fact, I pulled this lit review from this was a lit review from a very recent economics paper that basically said, here's here's the impact of technology. Now, all of these are actually, um, you know, I can't I can't speak to the the lit review from uh, Larry Cuban, but the other uh, four papers are papers where they had a really well-structured design. Um, you would think of this, you know, in the What Works Clearinghouse as being that experimental or quasi-experimental uh, level of research, and all of them found either zero effects or, in some cases, the the Angers paper actually found some negative effects. You know, but here I am. I, I believe that maybe technology would work, and so why? How can I wiggle out and say, well, maybe the answer is not really zero. Maybe they had it right, wrong, and. The, the first part is maybe just the authors are biased. I mean, there's always this thing you want to you want to be the one to shock people, and eh, it's pretty strong evidence. Um, the other one, which I think we've had a lot of discussion about so far, is that maybe the technology by itself is not the thing. You know, there's got to be a, a good structure behind it, or it's not going to work. And in fact, in some of the work that uh, some of these authors did, the places where the teachers actually had training, they actually started to see the reverse happening. Um, part of it is also we just the types of questions we ask, oftentimes we ask questions about the platform, when it's not about the platform, it's, it's really more thinking about the applications that we use. And so, so maybe we've got the wrong questions. Um, the wrong media, you know, is it really a computer or is it something else? What, what's the way that we can do that? Is it actually a website? Is it a, a handheld? Is it a tablet? What, is it some type of thing, a tool that students are actually working with and interacting? The other one that, and the last two that I think uh, are, I'm going to come back to, I think are kind of problems in this literature. One of them is that whenever we start a new industry, we always kind of give it a mulligan. Or what I mean by that is we give it a little free pass for a little bit. Um, we need it to develop. We need it to start to learn where it can really make a difference. And maybe that's still where we're at in some extent. And then finally, you know, this point about we don't know all the successes. And I'm going to come back to this because I think that especially in terms of thinking about uh, applications in the classroom, uh, we've got a dissemination problem that we need to kind of sort out as a profession. So I want to kind of step back. If you remember uh, Dick Renane's talk uh, yesterday, Dick Renane talked about this wonderful paper that he did with uh, Frank Levy and um, David Otter. And in that paper, they went and they measured kind of what the content was of different jobs, and they looked at the substitutability. And one of the things that they came back with very strongly was saying, look, there are some jobs that have routine tasks and that some that have these non-routine tasks. And these routine tasks those are the places where we expect technology to really streamline things and make a difference and substitute for the labor we used to do. So, you know, the, the, the great example is uh, when you take a check to the bank and cash the check, you know, it used to be that at night uh, people would come in and code all of those things. And now we can scan those, immediately capture those. That's a routine event that we can actually automate. On the other extent, when we have decisions that require a high level of kind of 
inference, a high level of critical reasoning. Those are things where technology, at least in their kind of paradigm, was not a substitute, it was a complement. And that's the role that we should see it in. Now, if you take that lens and you start to think about it in terms of schools and in terms of education, we have some events that are routine events in the classroom or in the educational process, and we have others which are non-routine events. And maybe it's a useful place to start to think about how we reorganize ourselves around the literature. You know, so let me give you a couple of, of different examples. So one of the routine things we need to do is we need to give teachers information about students. Now, the teachers can go and acquire that information themselves, right? They can give a test, they can grade the test, they can actually then look at the material and try to synthesize that material. But one of the applications that we're seeing that where we're, we're, we're starting to see is uh, different experiments where people are saying, well, maybe we can automate that and help. Oftentimes, teachers don't have the, the, you know, the time it takes them to design the test, administer the test, and then actually dissect the test to figure out where students are weak might be a lot slower than what I might be able to do with just basically taking the student's test results and coming back and saying, this student really doesn't understand multiplication and division of fractions. If you work with this student on that one, you know, they would have had a much higher score. They really understand addition and subtraction. So maybe, you know, as you're thinking about how you want to do instruction and how you want to reach out, that's where this student needs help. And there's a pilot actually that Susanna Loeb, who spoke yesterday, is actually doing in San Francisco, trying to do exactly this. Um, one of the ones that I've been involved in is in online courses in higher education, which is where I kind of live. Um, one of the things we're looking at is whether or not we can predict in real time whether a student might drop out. And so literally we're monitoring everything they say, when they say it, how frequently they're talking. And I can give you a probability at any moment in time in that student's course what the likelihood is that that student drops out. And suddenly you see some of these probabilities going along, going along, and suddenly it just drops. They disappear for a day or two. They don't turn in an assignment. And we can actually then, and I put the light bulb here because we call it turning on the light. All we do is we send the, the teacher a note and say, hey, you know, this student might be a student who needs a little bit of attention right now. Now, some of those, the teacher might not actually recognize the pattern as well or as fast as we could. And, and at least in kind of our early randomized trials, we're actually getting some kind of success in terms of this. Other ideas. You, data transmission to parents is essential in schools, and it's so broken. I mean, I have one daughter who comes home you know, religiously and shows me her binder and says, Dad, sign my binder. And I have another daughter who she would prefer we never see those. <laughs> and uh, many of you have children or have situations with this, and that's, our, that's how we trust. We send things home with the kids and we say, good luck, we hope the parents get this. And we often require a signature and uh, well, never mind. I won't. I won't admit anything there. So, um, the the other one that which I think is also peculiar to uh, you know very uh, Brazil's one setting in which it's valid is, oftentimes the school incurs a cost when they actually reach out to the parent directly, uh, in terms of actually having to pay for the phone call or something else. So one of the places where we've actually seen technology perhaps make a difference is substituting in for this routine task. So for example. Um, uh, Hikaru Madera and I have been working on this project trying to get the, and, and Hikaru has done all the work. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like on the, as the wagon here. Um, where we've been setting up this system where schools can basically text message the parents to give them announcements, to let them know when their child's absent, when their child's missing an assignment, or when something is coming up where the school needs to talk to the parent. So we, we, we started talking about this eight months ago. We finally turned on the switch and made it available to three schools in the month of October. 10,000 text messages went from the school to the, the parents in a month across three schools. Um, the one, uh, NBR working paper was just barely published where basically uh, they used the same idea to try to help parents of young children see when it might be a good time to actually do something. So they sent text messages to these parents. You know, it, it, reading to your child is a good and constructive thing and they tried to encourage and teach these parents how they could actually influence the literacy, literacy scores and they found that the students who basically were randomly chosen to get these and their parents got these message when they arrived in kindergarten they were already 0.2 standard deviations above the other students I mean, that's like a full grade level because their parents were reading to them and their parents were reading to them because somebody reminded them through a very simple and inexpensive text message Again, this idea, there's these routines. Um, 
I put up a list here of different places where I think there's routines that maybe technology can make a dent. Uh, scheduling. I have a daughter who cannot organize anything. Um, she's wonderful, I love her, um, but she doesn't remember anything. So what did we do this year? She has a little smart uh, phone and each of her teachers has a calendar and we basically just linked her smartphone to their calendars. So all of her events, all of her assignments automatically appear on her calendar. <sighs> Problem solved. Uh, school announcements. Um, at this point, uh, my, at least our school does all of those by text. Uh, data transmission from students to teachers. If you think about it, we've, uh, I use coursework here at Stanford to transfer information to my students. There's, there's Bl Blackboard, Canvas, all types of other ones. But on the other hand, we also use oftentimes something like a Dropbox for students to transmit. Uh, maybe that's going to be one of our cures for missing assignments. Some instruction, like basic math, might be something that's routine. And there's certainly some evidence coming out of Tennessee where when um, we use automated procedures or kind of um, some type of technology to teach some of the routine math, it frees up in pr professor time to actually think about others. Um, Paul already talked about the flipped classroom versus basic instruction, and there's just a lot of places here where routines happen and we might be able to do more. Okay, uh, let's go in, almost for the lightning round. Okay, what about the non-routine? And this is the place where I think that we need more work. And because this is a place where technology is really a complement. And so we can think about some of the examples today. Technology was really a complement to understand some other concepts. And this is the problem where I feel like we need some help as a group to get this better. The first part is we have a lot of small studies. 30 students here, 30 students there. We need to scale some things up. The other one is people are such believers in what they do. There is so much hype. And it is very hard to know what there's hard evidence behind and what there's not. And then the final point here, this politics of evaluation. You know, uh, one of uh, the Brazilian students, I would chase down this company trying to see if we could actually do an evaluation. And I became more and more and increasingly convinced that they would prefer never to know what the impact is because there's so much hype around their product. Uh, they were uh, making inroads and that would actually just slow them down. Okay, there's a couple other points I want to make. So let me just kind of put four other themes on the table for us to discuss. One is the timing. Um, when you do evaluations of technology, it is, a, it, is a, it is a moving target, and it's a moving target because as soon as you get a good evaluation, they change the technology. And so you're now evaluating something that's obsolete. And so this is a, one of the frustrating parts. Um, we've talked about a lot of things. We haven't even talked about costs. All of our research focuses on whether it works and not whether it's actually cost effective. Okay, last slide, um, training. Um, we've already mentioned that, I'll skip that one. Uh, instruction being routine versus non-routine. And this is a place where I think is gonna be one of our big questions. If the alternative is a very, very low quality live presentation, perhaps that's actually something that might actually, a, a routine uh, rote presentation might actually be better. I look forward to the discussion and, and I'll stop there.